Have you been feeling the effects of stress, burnout, or anxiety at work? Listen to the Anxious Achiever podcast to rethink the relationship between your career and your mental health. Get the Anxious Achiever wherever you find your podcasts and walk away with practical advice you can implement today. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by SAP. SAP Business AI. Embedded across SAP solutions, it drives immediate impact. From Jewel, your digital assistant, to AI-powered capabilities portfolio-wide, make confident decisions using your own data. SAP Business AI. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Hi, before we get started, I wanted to let you know about another live event we've got coming up October 10th in New York City. Our next Big Idea Club curator, Daniel Pink, is going to be in conversation with legendary magazine editor Adam Moss about his new bestseller, The Work of Art, How Something Comes from Nothing. So come hang out with us, have a cocktail, maybe network a little, and ask your questions about creativity. You can get tickets to the event or join via live stream by going to nextbigideaclub.com slash events, or you can use the link in the episode notes. See you there. Now, here's today's show. LinkedIn presents. Hi, everyone. It's Monday. I'm your host, Michael Kovnat, and this is the Next Big Idea Daily, the show that gives you quick insights from the latest nonfiction books, making it effortless for you to get smarter while sipping your morning coffee. Just make sure you click follow in your podcast player to get our future episodes and sign up for our book of the day newsletter using the link in the episode notes. Now, how would you like to learn the secrets of secret agents? Well, naturally, spies themselves aren't likely to divulge, but Jeremy Hurowitz has spent time in the world of spycraft and brought back techniques all of us can use in business and in life. Jeremy has worked as a journalist, a corporate security consultant, and a policy advisor on national security for the Joseph Rainey Center for Public Policy. He's written for Bloomberg, USA Today, The Hill, and Forbes, and his new book is called Sell Like a Spy, The Art of Persuasion from the World of Espionage. Here he is to share a few of his big ideas. Spies are not who you think they are. Spies are not James Bond or Jason Bourne. They don't typically wear tuxedos and hang out at casinos and drive Aston Martins. They're not typically engaged in gunfights and car chases and seduction. No, the work of spies is much closer to a psychiatrist or a therapist or a great relationship manager, like say a wealth management consultant. Spies, in my estimation, are actually the world's best salespeople because spies have to make the most difficult sale in the world, which is convincing someone to commit treason against their country or organization. It's important to understand that spies are not superheroes. They're incredibly good at relating to people, to understanding people, to influencing people. Because if we can take the world of espionage away from the glamorized and sensationalized fare of Hollywood and bring it down to the everyday level where actual spy tradecraft takes place, you'll see that these are skills that we can incorporate into our careers and into our everyday lives. When I speak with audiences and writing in my book, I like to share what I call spy quotes. They're quotes from former intelligence officers, and I use them to illuminate a certain concept or idea. And this quote is my favorite amongst all of them. Every good intelligence officer has a real bond with their target on some level and in some regard. My build on that is that it's about connection, not deception. Spies, just like salespeople, are trying to connect really deeply with their targets, trying to get to know them, trying to find a way to build rapport. And this is where we can really start to begin to learn a great deal from intelligence officers. Because step back and think about the challenges that spies face in recruiting their targets. They are often asked to recruit people they would otherwise want nothing to do with in their lives. Spies have to target criminals, terrorists, diplomats from some of the world's worst regimes. 
and they need to find a way to relate to these people to establish that genuine bond that I just referenced. So they leverage what's known as radical empathy, trying to find that kernel of humanity that exists in every person, no matter how odious they might be. It means the criminal who is actually a devoted family man. It means the terrorist who practices acts of charitable good. A good intelligence officer is going to focus on these kernels of humanity and not the many flaws of these individuals to find a way to forge that real bond because these connections with their targets are genuine and they're meaningful and they're incredibly important when it comes to asking these targets to do extraordinary things for them. We in the everyday world experience similar challenges, though the stakes are much lower. Think about it, whether you're a spy or a salesperson or just someone in everyday life, we encounter people that we don't necessarily have great rapport with right away. We talk about hitting it off. There might be a situation where you don't hit it off with somebody, but you still want to influence them. So you still need to look for that kernel of humanity and overlook the other areas. So you need to look for areas of convergence, of similarity, of things that you can admire when you're dealing with someone difficult. I also want to share one other technique that is a really important one, which is making yourself vulnerable. This can be an incredibly impactful way to bridge that gap with somebody you might not be connecting with. And I'm going to share a quick personal story about how that works with me. A little over a decade ago, I lost all hearing in my right ear because I had a brain tumor removed. Happily, I am okay now, but this hearing loss deeply impacts my life. And if you have a meal with me, I want to try to sit at the table with everyone to my left. If you're walking on the street, I want to keep you on my left so I can hear you well. And many times I need to explain why it is that I need this. And I have encountered many times and often in business situations where someone is maybe treating me with some distance because salespeople are often treated with a little bit of suspicion. But if I wind up sharing this detail about myself, something extraordinary happens. I go from not just being a salesperson to being an actual human being suddenly. And another important thing happens, which is that people tend to respond to something that you share about yourself in kind. So that cold, distant person I was just trying to break through with, after I share this detail about myself, suddenly tells me something very vulnerable about themselves or a loved one. And we bridge that gap and create a little bit more human intimacy. Everybody has a different set of experiences they can draw upon. Mine is very tactical when I share this. I have to hear on a certain side. But you can pull from your experience and you can find the comfort level that you feel okay with to make yourself vulnerable and open yourself up to people to forge deeper connections. Elicitation is a way to collect information, to collect intelligence in a more strategic fashion. Because whether you're a spy, a salesperson, or a journalist, if you meet somebody of interest, you often want to learn all about that person. But if you start peppering somebody with questions, especially very probing questions, you can bring about a response that is the opposite of what you're going for. It could lead to suspicion, defensiveness, and those are things that we want to avoid. So elicitation offers us a chance to learn more deeply from somebody without asking questions that could alarm them. I'm going to give you an example about how spies think about this and a training exercise that they go on. I was told about a training exercise from the farm, the CIA's famed training facility in rural Virginia. A cohort was taken to a little seaside village in Virginia and given the following assignment. Go up to somebody and start talking to them and learn as much as you can without asking a question. You might be asking yourself, well, how do you learn from somebody without asking a question? So let me give you an example about how this might look. Perhaps it's late May around Memorial Day weekend, and it's an unseasonably warm day. I approach somebody on the street, I start chatting with them, and I say something like, my goodness, what a sweltering day. I'm originally from the Pacific Northwest, and where I come from, it doesn't get this hot even at the height of summer, so I am really struggling today. Perhaps that person replies and says, you know, I grew up in South Florida, and it's this hot or hotter for most of the year, so I'm not really phased by that. Now, I didn't ask any question in that encounter. I volunteered something about myself, and we see an example of somebody responding in kind there as well. 
that is a human tendency. And by leveraging that, I was able to learn a little bit about them, specifically where they're from, by volunteering something about myself. So that is an example of elicitation. I've had the good fortune in my career of working with former chief hostage negotiators from the FBI in the world of kidnap for ransom consulting. And they leverage what's known as skills of social influence to try to subtly influence oftentimes very fraught encounters. One of the things I think is so interesting that they're able to do is calm a difficult situation through their tone of voice and the speed of their speech. So if an FBI hostage negotiator is trying to communicate with someone who's taken people hostage on the phone or on a walkie-talkie, and that person might be shouting and talking very fast, and they're very excited, the FBI hostage negotiator is going to maintain a calm tone of voice and speak in a slow and deliberate manner. Because behavioral science teaches us that if you have one party of a conversation insisting on this tone of voice and speed in the speech, as a baseline, eventually the other parties tend to adhere to that. And this leads to a calming of a difficult situation. So if someone is angry with you and you can try to maintain a steadfast and calm presence and speak in a slow and deliberate manner, typically that person will calm down and revert to your baseline. Other things to think about in a dramatic encounter, if you're seated in a room and someone comes in and they're angry, don't stand up. That will only raise the temperature of the encounter. Invite that person to sit down and tell you what's on their mind, and that will help things. Let someone vent. Let someone completely get whatever they want to say off their chest, even if you're inclined to interrupt them because they're wrong or for whatever reason. Let them fully unburden themselves. It will help calm things down. Thank the person for what they're sharing with you, even though that might be difficult because you feel they're wrong. It will calm the person. Ultimately, if you can't get to resolution in a calm manner, try to stall for time. Emotion trumps cognition, which is why if you have a dramatic encounter with somebody, you might have found yourself later in that day thinking, I wish I had said a certain thing, because your brain is not working well when it's full of emotion. So if you need to, ask if you could get back to the person, call a timeout, and then you'll find that you're going to be handling things in a lot more of a lucid manner, and time tends to calm things down generally. Now, a lot of former FBI agents and CIA case officers are advertising the ability to be a human lie detector to corporate teams, and I have found this to be untrue. There's really no such thing as a human lie detector because people are so complex, we can't tell with any high degree of consistency that someone is definitely lying when they're talking to you. But we can identify red flags that show deceptive behavior. Many of you will know Tom Brady as the former star quarterback of the New England Patriots. And many years ago, there was a scandal known as Deflategate, where the Patriots were accused of deflating footballs in order to gain advantage. Tom Brady was asked by the media if he was involved in deflating the footballs, and Tom answered that he would never cheat. Well, he didn't really directly answer the question, right? He just said something a little bit vague about cheating. Now, that doesn't mean that Tom Brady is a cheater, but it is a red flag that anybody who's trying to get to the bottom of this matter should keep in mind and note when dealing with this question. Another one to think about is known as oaths or You can say to somebody, I swear on my children that I have not done this. Typically, that is an example of a red flag and deceptive behavior as well, because why would you be so dramatic? Why not just directly answer the question? So I've given you a couple there. It's also good to note that the body reveals what the mind conceals. I write extensively about body language, but for now, let's just say, if you're concerned that somebody might be deceptive with you, watch how their body responds when they're saying something. Sometimes people will even shake their head negatively when they're saying yes to something because their subconscious is saying that. And if you can keep in mind these details, you'll be able to discern a little bit more about their intentions. Thank you, Jeremy. All right, listeners, you can get a copy of Sell Like a Spy wherever you get your books. And wherever you are on your career journey, we've got something for you at the next Big Idea Club. 
from a curated hardback subscription service to an inspirational app, masterclasses, and live networking events like our upcoming conversation with Dan Pink and Adam Moss. Check it all out at nextbigideaclub.com and use the code DAILY to get a special discount. And come back here tomorrow. I'm going to have some big ideas for you from the new book, The Second 50, Answers to the Seven Big Questions of Midlife and Beyond. I'm Michael Kovnett. See you tomorrow.